everyone, it's Jules. Welcome to this very special and awesome episode of All Things Iceland, where I have the pr- the privilege and honor of interviewing this panel about behind the music in Iceland, specifically the Icelandic music scene and the different changes that have been taking place over the years. I mean, so much has happened in all of our lives, but specifically music and the connection between the country and individuals who fall in love with so many awesome Icelandic artists and their creativity. I just thought it'd be really fun to be able to get some insight into how the music scene has been developing over the years, as well as coping with COVID, the artists, and so much more that's in store for the future. So it's my pleasure to introduce, and I'm just gonna do a short intro for everybody so we can get into all of these questions that I have, because we just have a little bit of time. And we're gonna start off first with introducing Siki, who is the managing director of Iceland Music. Yeah, so waving there. (laughs) And the Iceland Music mission is to help tell the story of Icelandic music around the world as well as the Music Export Office of Iceland. And for those who are fans of Björk, you would be happy to know that he played with her in the Sugar Cubes. So in his own right, awesomely famous and (laughs) and a great musician. The next person is Maria Rutt, who is the head of the cultural office for the city of Reykjavik, as well as the project manager for Reykjavik City Music, a project which is basically in terms of supporting and enhancing and improving the music scene in the Reykjavik area. And she was the manager of Auskir, as well as the reggae band, the Icelandic reggae band Hjalmar, which some people might not even know. (laughs) There is an Icelandic reggae band, but they're amazing, FYI. I mean, obviously Auskir is as well, but for those who don't know about Hjalmar, definitely have a listen. And then we have Will, last but certainly not least, who is the managing director and head of bookings for Iceland Airwaves, the music festival that brings so many people from around the world to experience Icelandic music as well as other artists. And he's been in the music business for over 20 years, wearing many different hats. You know, it's like today he's putting on his interviewee hat (laughs) and talking about airwaves. But he's also a published author, and I have to throw that in there. He didn't put it into his bio, but I'm going to say it anyway, (laughs) about like a book called 50 Queer Music Icons Who Changed the World. So such a fascinating, awesome panel. Thank you so much to everybody who is here today. And I'm just going to do one quick announcement because I want people to know about an event that's coming up. So as many of you know, Iceland Airways, unfortunately, is not happening this year. But as an alternative, which is awesome because it's good to have something, you know, that we all can look forward to, is that on November 6th, which is a Saturday, it's coming up very soon, the we're having live from Reykjavik, which is a hybrid event. So it's in person and there's only a select amount of you know seats in these venues, but there's also a streaming aspect of it. And artists like Ausker, John Grant, Briet, Aran Khan, Daughters of Reykjavik and more will be performing and you don't want to miss that. So I have a special link for my listeners and watchers of All Things Iceland in the description box where you can get a discount for the streaming. So you can basically have a concert in your living room. So definitely check that out. Use that link. And now I'm going to get into the interview because so much to talk about. So this question is a general one for all of you, and that has to do with before COVID, which if you can remember that far back, <laughs> which is in essence now considered back in the day because it still feels so long ago. I just think it would be great if you can give an overview about the Icelandic music scene and what was happening in terms of what point were we at in, you know, before COVID hit and in, in terms of spreading Icelandic music and awareness and the artist. So I'm going to start with Maria Rutt, um, because you're specifically working in Reykjavik and, and helping supporting artists there. So can you give some insight about the music scene before COVID? Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, just in general, about the music scene in, in Reykjavik and in Iceland, I would say that it's um, it's small, but very intimate and creative. It's always buzzing and definitely was before before COVID hit. Um, uh, yeah, it's a small it's a small music scene. People know each other. They work together. They support each other. 
Um, we have amazing festivals here. We have some great venues, although we are always uh, having a little bit of a challenge with the venues that we have, especially the small ones with the changing of the city, the gentrification. So there are definitely some issues that we that we had going on already back then. Uh, yeah, but in general, I think we were in a really good place. Always place for improvements and more support from the government and the city, etc. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great scene, and I'm sure the city can also add a lot to that. He has a more better overview of the whole scene in the country. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And yes, Siki, please, if you will. Yeah, I I agree with uh, Maria it was, It is a very sort of energetic scene. And it, it's kind of special because it's small and very interactive. I often speak of the, the certain lack of music business in Iceland, but there is a very interesting music community. And it's a very communal thing. Um, well, we are starting to see some very interesting uh, changes in the in the business area as well, where we see young companies coming up today that are basically doing things their way. They're helping manage artists. They're helping themselves release, retain their rights, stuff like that. We're also sort of seeing people branch out a lot more and find um, collaborators outside of Iceland. That's something that's always sort of been... We've been pretty good at doing that, um, partially because the scene is small and information travels quite well. But uh, in the last, I would say, five years, I've seen a lot of uh, difference in sort of the variety of Icelandic music that is finding an audience in, in different areas, um, not just the um, what people perceive as the typical indie stuff from Iceland, although. I don't understand that. <laughs> For me, there's no such thing as typical stuff. But um, yes, and it helps with, I mean, there's a lot of things that have been going on in the last 10 years, even longer. Like Airwaves has been a huge tool in, in exporting Iceland music, Icelandic music, one of our strongest, uh, strongest tools in the box. And we do have other tools and it's a combination of things. But of course. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> well, speaking of airwaves, Will, if you can give your perspective about this, please. I mean, I, I think, you know, coming into it as, as a non-Icelander and, and where we were at pre-pandemic, um, certainly, you know, what's really evident in, in Iceland is, is the, the, the wealth of talent in that country, you know, mm -hmm. comparatively speaking to any other country in the world, I would think musically is incredible. I'm not entirely sure why that is the case, but but it seems that that there's this amazing ability for people to work together so well musically and also kind of by sheer nature of their musical abilities, um, create music which is of a of a you know truly global quality and consistently mm -hmm. too it's funny i was at a conference the other week actually in finland and people were making jokes about the nordics which i'll probably get into trouble about <laughs> but they were basically saying that like i think it was like you know sweden's got the songwriters but not the singers and and you know finland has the the maybe the business but not the songs and norway's <laughs> like this and like denmark has has the singers but not the songs and and i think iceland has pretty much kind of like this cohesive world that takes in everything. I think I think where we were getting to as well was starting to see the beginning at, in the last couple of years pre-pandemic of some artists that were really forging new sounds. Um, as Siggy said, things that maybe are slightly away from what had been typically seen as the Icelandic indie sound. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like from the perspective of Airwaves, having kind of like helped kind of reshape or, or kind of refocus the festival in the last couple of years prior, we were very excited about about where things were going to go because we, we've worked really really hard to to um, maintain, I think, a very good dialogue with all the other important players in the music scene. You know, meaning the city with with Iceland Music, with Steph, um, with our sponsors. You know, um, we see and we recognise that that you know Airwaves is a really integral tool for for everybody, and we really tried have tried to kind of our best to kind of integrate everybody's needs into, into that into that situation. Of course, um, you know, where we're at right now is a very different story, but but we're mm -hmm. um, constantly pivoting. And with that pivot, we're always constantly trying to kind of help each other find silver linings, as it were, um, in every situation we face. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to all of you for that, because we are going to jump into 
COVID now in terms of <laughs> we're in it. That's just life as we know it at the moment. And as you remember, you mentioned, Will, the pivoting part. So I think it would be really great to understand the shift that's happened in order to adapt. Because I know, you know, when it hit, obviously, everyone, for the most part, was like, okay, what do we do now? And how do we still provide experiences? And the artists, of course, they need to work. They need to make money and, and continue on with their career. So it would be good to get some insight on what some things have been put in place to help artists. Uh, so digitally and, you know, being able, of course, to continue, especially the up and coming ones who really need to get their names out there. So I'm going to start with Siki, actually, on this one, just to get an idea of what Iceland Music is doing or just in general what's happening around uh, the evolution and shift during COVID. Right. There were a few things that kicked in pretty early in COVID that we decided to do a, like a, an educational website for artists with Reykjavik Music City and others um, that was focused on basically give, giving artists basic information that uh, they needed, not only how to sort of, well, to navigate the industry, so shall we say, everything from sort of uh, registering your music correctly to understanding uh, rights management and, and stuff like that. And uh, there were also sort of programs that we were able to partake in, like uh, a program called Global Music Match, which is quite clever, where um, it was basically focused on people in the more in the folk and roots scene, where there were groups that were created by uh, there were like five, six people, artists in a group, and then one coach, which was like someone from a festival or some people that knew the uh, workings of the folk music business very well. And in these groups, they would do focuses on different... If I were an artist in that group, I would be in focus for like two weeks to all the other mm. fan bases of all the other artists in my group. And nice. it was a very clever, cleverly designed program by, uh, by uh, the music offices in, in Canada, Australia, and, and Scotland. And they invited a lot of other people to come into this game. So... That was one of the online things that I thought were done very well in COVID. There were also streamings that were done very well. I mean, Airwaves did a wonderful version of of Live from Reykjavik, a two two uh, like two full nights of, of wonderfully recorded stuff, and and they got a lot of promoted that quite well and got a lot of attention to that. We might have gotten. Uh, <laughs> there are these he's just events. in the middle of saying something are, amazingly ingenious, and he's he's frozen. <laughs> We are, are sort of still facing the challenges of monetizing uh, streaming events, especially for smaller artists. Uh, but the, the promotion, there are, are promotional uh, procedures that we have been a part of that I, I think have been working very well, Global Music Match being one of them. Um, and we've also, also, with the other music associations in Iceland, had to sort of... <laughs> how to go out and, and lobby the government for support for artists, which is everybody's been doing everywhere, not just us. And that's also a, 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 an issue that's kind of kind of tough because often yeah. oftentimes the, the, the artists fit don't fit very well into the box of, of how companies are run and how, how what mm. information they have to uh, render to be applicable for, for certain assistance and grants and stuff like that. That's been a challenge. Um, and yes, but I mean, one of the good things that I can say that has happened in COVID is that it has sort of tightened up a lot of the Icelandic music community at least. So now we are better at speaking to the government and, and as one with, with one voice. So, yeah. That's great. So the unity, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And Maria Ruth, uh, in terms of COVID, what's, what's been the adaptability plan happening in Reykjavik? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it was definitely an in interesting journey that we all went through, not only here, but everywhere. And in the beginning, you could see all the artists going online, uh, engaging with the audience, doing stuff on their own terms. And then that sort of developed into, okay, but enough of that. Now we want to step it up a mm -hmm. little bit. So go more into the professional aspect of the streaming. But at the, at the same time, like at first, after all the energy and everybody just adapting and trying their best, 
um, the whole sort of music community and especially us that are working uh, in these offices, you know, in the associations, etc., found, you know, uh, the feeling was that we really needed to step up and organize ourselves better mm-hmm. and work together and and of course speak to the government, speak to the city, etc., just to let them know what the situation is. And then despite of people just being out there and doing their best, there was really need for support. Mm-hmm. So it's been like this uh, yeah journey and then the government actually responded there were a lot of different actions put in place some of them worked really well others not yeah. so in, in the beginning the, the government uh, started off by increasing the project funding like the typical project funding that we have here and the artist salaries mm-hmm. which is something special that we have in Iceland I don't know if you know about it Jules but no. you can apply to get like a monthly salary as an artist that's amazing for, uh, yeah for can't remember if it's one month and then three months, six months, nine months, etc., yeah. up to two years, I think, maximum. So, you know, the government increased like all of that support. Um, the artist salaries, that was good, but the project funding was a little bit problematic because it was, you know, you had to go and do projects mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't exactly the right, right, right time. You know, you could record an album, but like doing concerts and touring, etc., that was difficult. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's actually when we started lobbying and then, you know, th- there were like some different actions put in, in place, like an income loss, mm. um, I don't know what to call it in English, but yeah, to make up for the loss of income and these kind of things. And like Siki said, it was a little bit difficult for artists and uh, the small music businesses in Iceland, which are mostly small, to use that. And then I think uh, where we are now is that, you know, just COVID has stretched along and it's like, you know, public authorities, they just checked in the box, Mm, they did something, but now it's just ongoing and it's still hard. Mm. And so we are sort of organizing again and just, okay, we we need to really, you know, step this up and and, and figure out a way, yeah, you know, to support the whole scene. So that's that's where we're at at the moment, I'd say. Great. It's great. And okay. yeah, and just yeah, and just I think and for example, you know, Iceland Airways and Life from Reykjavik is definitely a fantastic case of adopting to a difficult situation and uh, you know, it's an interesting case. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which <laughs> and I think it's great too yeah. just in terms of having the support that the artists get from organizations that can lobby on their behalf because I feel like that is quite a difficult thing in terms of feeling you know access to individuals but also what Siki mentioned about unity and I think that's one of the most probably beautiful things is hearing people utilizing power as a group in order to get things and support and yeah I'm sure there's a lot of people now who want to be like I want to be an artist in Iceland so I can get paid <laughs> like, because it's because that's like part of the biggest hurdle is the starving artist right and continuously having to work another job or whatever else just to do what really you know is inside of you needs to come out so that's beautiful to hear and yes will in terms of ice and airwaves and live from Reykjavik I'm wondering about that process because I don't know you know maybe there's some other adaptability things that you've de- you're doing but I'm wondering about the process of getting from like okay ice and airwaves isn't happening we're doing something so what is it going to be yeah i mean it was a real process and it was a process of of obviously kind of different from year to year um firstly kind of i guess for 2020 the issue we faced at the time was uh perhaps more around the fact that there was no vaccinations um anywhere in the world um you know and we'd seen the second and third waves um hit iceland and everywhere else and it was a real concern um then we had a period, of course, of this year where things are okay again, and they're not really okay, and we're facing a very different situation again mm-hmm. now, where you know um, Iceland and many other parts of the world are really well vaccinated, but we're still seeing kind of rises in cases and and a fair degree of uncertainty. But um, the process of kind of like moving from a, of a physical festival to a virtual festival, um, you know, it, it's it's funny. I mean, it, in many ways, it, it's um, there are a lot of similarities as well as differences. I think where we're continuing to try and evolve and what we're trying to do this year as well is is to find some new challenges to keep the uh find new ways to 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 kind of keep people engaged in the storytelling the um 
what we did last year because the, the restrictions were very, very, very enforced um, when we were working on the project last year. We actually had no audiences at all. We had a mm. camera crew that had to be kept separate to the audio crew, which had to be separate to the lighting crew, separate to the wow. band, separate to us. So it was really, really difficult. We had to pre-film everything over kind of, I think it was, we ended up doing about eight or nine days of filming that time because because of these restrictions. And, and of course, inherently, you know, there's a lot of parameters and factors which made it kind of, logistically quite challenging um this year that the plan is to do something quite different we're actually going to be live live which is really exciting and a new challenge so we're going to be yeah. streaming from four different venues iconic Reykjavik venues downtown and each venue will be presenting different music and you'll be able to view these through a different uh, through a viewer concurrently and then watch them back over 24 hours so um that's really really exciting but um i, I guess the the adaptation you know it's it's great to have something to do. I would I'm not going to lie about that, and it's great that there's an audience in place. Um, you know, I, I I'd be lying to say if I wasn't disappointed that we couldn't do the festival this year. You know, mm -hmm. personally, I'm extremely disappointed, and um, uh, you know, it's also kind of I guess for all of us, not just me or, or the festival, but for but I imagine for Reykjavik Music City, for Iceland Music, and everybody else. You know, this year alone, we had so many other things planned, not just around, you know, using airwaves as the core, but we had, you know, all sorts of different people coming in from all over the world to really experience um, Icelandic music mm -hmm. and to do business with Icelandic music as well. So, yeah, it's been really challenging. But, you know, as I said before, we always try and find silver linings in these situations. And I'm really pleased to say that, you know, despite the airwaves, airwaves not happening this year, Reykjavik Music City and Iceland Music have really kind of stepped up and they're doing all sorts of incredible things around this week. Um, kind of off their own back that that are going to continue to make some meaningful things happen for Iceland, Icelandic music, um, you know, hopefully into 2022, which is fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. And do you see any of the ad ad adaptations going on in the future once we get back to some idea of what, you know, what was normal for us before? If there are things that have changed, shifted, you're like, actually, that really works. I, I, I'm going to we should probably keep going with this specific thing or a few things. And well, you, you can it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, I, I guess, I guess, you know, it depends upon the appetite, but you know, hybrid, certainly kind of like the idea of hybrid events, I think has an appeal because we know that in any given year, especially for airwaves, you know, it's an acquired taste. If you want to come to Reykjavik in the first week of November, you know, it's just after Halloween and Thanksgiving. Um, not always an easy time for people to get off. It's also we know not not for everybody. It's a it's not affordable for everybody to come every single mm -hmm. year to 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 Reykjavik. So if there's a way that we can kind of capture that storytelling and share it with people ongoing, I think that's really really valuable. Um, that's probably the key, the key the key one for me. We'd like to kind of continue to document and share share this event better than we were previously. Um, mm -hmm. I think too that you know. Um, if anything, we just kind of continue to try and make as much value collectively out of whatever we do moving forward. And and by that, I mean, even the example of this week with, with what um, Reykjavik Music City and the city are doing and, and Iceland Music, really kind of embracing every moment we can and try and turn over as many stones as we can and work collaboratively mm -hmm. as much as we can to really kind of like just, you know, make the most of every opportunity as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And Siki, I mean, you can speak to this as well uh, in terms of, is there anything that you're, you pinpoint and say like, yeah, actually this worked pretty well in COVID. Surprisingly, we, we want to keep doing this. Yeah, I mean, we're going to uh, take the heart sort of, like I said earlier, the, the projects that really were working in COVID, like this, these online collabor collaboration projects where, where artists are mm -hmm. actually opening up uh, to their fan base other artists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, stuff like mm -hmm. this. We can do a lot with that sort of stuff, and um, mm -hmm. and also basically what we're focused on, like Will mentioned in this first in next week, actually the first week of November, is basically uh, to, to to carry on doing educational stuff for the music scene, and and sort of we're doing master classes and all sorts of stuff, and there's a big gathering in in Reykjavik where of Nordic. Uh, music venues and, and festivals, mm -hmm. part of a program called Pulse, and I mean Reykjavik Music Safety is helping us to put together, we're doing a, like a showcase with them, curated by Will, we're doing all sorts of collaborations that we're trying to sort of um, beat people over the head with, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I mean, I mean the, the music 
the music community is quite sort of thankful for this, and we are getting a really good response to that. That we're trying to sort of mm. keep the keep the um, keep the flame burning and and help people to try to educate themselves and create basically better, shall we say, quote unquote, exportable projects. Um, right. Yeah. So when I mean we're starting to see the music scene open up quite a bit, and people are starting to start touring again even though a lot of places are, of course, blocked book because tours have been pushed forward for now like one and a half years and stuff. Yeah. We are dealing with a weird and unprecedented thing, which is this COVID thing. And what I think the music business is probably, in my mind, adapting pretty well. I think it is a very adaptable space and people, musicians are, are very quick to adapt to mm-hmm. difficult situations. And yeah. that's well. Yeah, I think we're, there's a lot of stuff we can learn from this as well. And I do agree with Will that the hybrid event is here to stay for, mm-hmm. you know, for better or worse. But it's basically an adaptation to a very strange time. And I think a lot of people, are, even like Will mentioned, it's not, not everybody can come. So a lot of people will also be grateful for this opportunity to be able to enjoy the music, even if it's from afar or the live performances, I should say. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I was going to say just quickly, I think Maria once had a very good point about this as well. It's not just kind of people overseas, but also people within Iceland, you know, you yeah, know either point. generationally or, or, or people in other cities, even people in Huffington Field, you know, that maybe they can, mm-hmm. you know, it's like. <laughs> where where oh, she is, right. exactly. <laughs> she can speak directly to them. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maria, do you have anything you want to add regarding that? Yeah, well, I, I think, yeah, just what Will said, I mean, I mean, it's people even in hospitals, people that, you know, have anxiety yeah. or like can't or don't want to go to a festival. There are so many aspects to this. So I think, it, you know, it's definitely interesting to see how this develops in, in the next coming years. But uh, for us at Reykjavik Music City and um, also the Visit Reykjavik office, which is the promotional office of Reykjavik, um, I think what COVID taught us and that we will definitely take away with us is uh, also what we talked about, the storytelling part and just communicating all the different stories of the music scene in the city, online, mm-hmm. in partnership with festivals and things that are going on here. We've, we've sort of stepped up the game in that and we just realized like how, you know, what, what a tool it is. So we've been creating all sorts of uh, content for the social media and just just definitely pushed us in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, I mean, even though obviously we had like internet and online stuff before COVID, but it's just, you know, we've been forced to use it more and it's it's shortened the distance between us. And that means also that you don't have to travel abroad for every Mm -hmm. event. I mean, that's also for the environmental sake, but um, you know, you can participate in events online and, and these kind of things. So I, I definitely, it's it's interesting, interesting times, and it will be exciting to see how it evolves. Yeah, absolutely. And social media, I think that for everybody, like the TikToks and Instagrams of the world, you know, have really also for many artists been able to give more behind the scenes because they're not traveling as much, and so it's like you know, you feel like you have different abilities to showcase how you're making your music and things that are happening and like Siki said about the collaboration part so we only have eight minutes left so I'm going to do some little quick fire (laughs) questions and I'm going to start with Siki on this one just because in terms of Iceland music there's your mission of this story about Icelandic music that you want to tell the world so if you could give kind of like a short description of what is that story that you're trying to convey to people around the world about Icelandic music? It's a very good question. I, I don't know if I can answer that in a short, in, in a couple of sentences. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we are sort of, one of the things we're doing now is, is kind of fun. We're, we're doing like a QR code with our playlists that we're curating. And it's wonderful to see people's reaction to this mm-hmm. because it's uh, quite they are so varied and, and interesting, actually. Um, it's a happy story here. I'm actually at Womex, which is a world music festival in, in Portugal. We're promoting another program that we're doing called Re- Record in Iceland, which people are really interested about, too. Because travel, when travel starts coming back in, as it is doing now, people are also very interested or thinking about sort of, it's not only don't travel, it's also like when you're, when you're traveling, travel better. And sort of trying to minimize mm-hmm. your carbon footprint and stuff like that. 
So we're offering like a 25% rebate program on recording in Iceland that also travel, covers your travel costs. And people are quite excited about that here uh, down at Womex. Um, you also, we're talking about the people that are, have to cross the Atlantic. If you have to cross the Atlantic, why don't you stop by nice and make some recording, utilize your trips better, travel better, uh, be more aware of this whole thing. And I, I seem to be speaking to a very responsive audience here where people seem to be quite aware of it. But the message in general, we're talking about Iceland and Icelandic music on many different levels. One, I just wanted to point this report in Iceland thing as, as one of them, because it's, it's a different it's a different angle. But it is certain, I'm interested and always very excited about collaborative things. And when people, one of this, one of the ideas behind Record in Iceland is not just to create business for the studio or for the airlines. It's, it's also to mm -hmm. uh, talk about collaboration and bring in people from abroad to record in Iceland and collaborate with Icelandic musicians. We've been very fortunate, like in the last year, in COVID, there was like a, an orchestra up north that was able to record a lot of film music for a lot of films, a lot of composers all around mm -hmm. the world. So they were quite busy all during yeah. during COVID just by utilizing this idea. So, I mean, yeah. it's a uh, many yeah, cool thing. Thank you. I, I, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to sum up <laughs> the Icelandic music story since it is so varied and there's so much happening. Maria uh, Ruth, in terms of just the Reykjavik city music uh, and what's happening, what can people look forward to? Because I think like part of the experiences of not only the artists, but of course the fans that come in the future, what are you seeing as like something do you want to share with individuals that they can look forward to coming and possibly being a part of? Yes, I mean, oh, so many things, but um, uh, definitely our fantastic uh, festivals like Iceland Airways, but we also have uh, festivals serving different genres like Dark Music Days, which is contemporary and a little bit of an experimental, uh, the experimental music scene, sort of a little bit where, where it all stems mm -hmm. from. So definitely check out all the festivals as well, because there's loads of them for different genres if you're interested. Um, and then I think the magic for me, for example, when Iceland Airways is happening is uh, when people are going uh, around and about in the darkness and it's cold mm -hmm. and you're going into all these small uh, venues and uh, you can't bump into people, you know, your favorite Icelandic musician in the street or just in the restaurant. It's just so small and, and intimate. And I think that's, you know, that's what makes it unique. Yes. And and also, I mean, like Cedric said, we are also trying to promote uh, promote uh, Iceland and Reykjavik as a place where you can come and record and make your music. And that's also something uh, important to stress that, I mean, Reykjavik is a city, it's so close to the nature, yeah. but you still get the city vibe. We have fantastic studios here. Uh, and also just the access to other musicians. You can make things happen very mm -hmm. fast. Uh, in, in Reykjavik, so I'd also like to highlight that. But yeah, but we're working on also just storytelling, yeah. telling those stories that you can experience. You can go on a music walk around the mm. city, learn about the scene, etc. Yeah. So all sorts of different things. That's awesome. And yeah, we have just a few minutes. <laughs> so well, uh, in terms of similarly, with what people can look forward to with Iceland Airwaves coming up in the future. Well, I think I think it's just the the magic of experiencing, you know, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, um, really being absolutely subsumed with music. I mean, there's a palpable sense of community and excitement that I think is really, really you can't. It's very difficult to, to describe unless you witness it. You know, I think there's mm -hmm. also something so delightful to see, like again with the spirit of community. You know, Iceland is like a musician running from one gig to another with a keyboard under his arm to play with four <laughs> different people that he was in the group with. But on top of that as well, um, I, I, I think that, you know, the Icelandic music scene is, is so vibrant, so important to Icelandic tourism, no doubt, mm -hmm. you know, um, and to the city. And that uh, I think that, you know, Reykjavik is a very, very special place, but I think in, in Airwaves Week or any festival week in Iceland, it's an extra special place. I think music holds a really, really big part in the heart of Icelanders. And I think experiencing Reykjavik kind of through the lens of song is, is something that's extra, extra special. I just can't recommend it enough, really.
Awesome. Okay. This is one question that I want to ask, and it's the one I ask to end my show always, and that is your favorite Icelandic word or phrase, and it can be related to music or not. That's okay. But I'm going to start with Maria Ruth, if you, anything came to mind for you. I was going to say, you have to start with Siki. Yeah. <laughs> Siki, Siki but... doesn't, he looks like he's still <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's like, oh. No, I, I always, when I'm asked, like, your favorite music or famous or something, I can't, can't yeah. remember anything. So, um, but um, I always had a favorite word, though, and it's pulla. Pulla. And right. uh, pulla, and it's, uh, <laughs> I just think it's so funny. But it's, uh, what is the English word for it, Siki? Pulla. It's like where you rest your feet or you can sit at it like just on like the a floor, footstool. Like a small, kind of like this, kind of like that. But I just think it's a funny word, mm. like pulla or kotiletta, which is, which is lamb chops. Mm. Kotiletta. Okay. I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but then we also have something uh, called Erna Konfekt, which is like a chocolate to my mm-hmm. ears. And I, I also like I like that, that one, yeah. Music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Siki, what about you? Probably the word skrapatol, which is a strange word, meaning something like a, like a scraper or actually a, a broken down car. Um, it just has a, such a musical sound to me, skrapatol. I, I don't know, it's just Krapatol. something that popped into my head. Mm. <laughs> okay. And what about you, Will? Well, these guys, are gonna ha- these guys are gonna have to say it for me because I can't pronounce anything well in Icelandic. <laughs> I get laughed at constantly. I can't even pronounce the venues we booked the festival into. But, but, the, phrase, but the phrase I, I really love um, is window weather. What, what's that one? Oh, gluka weather. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think that's yeah, that is a great one. Charming yes, and so inherently Icelandic. And there's a real, it gives me a real sense of delight. It kind of says a lot about Icelanders, about the relationship with the weather, about their love of everything being cozy. You know, it's great. It's great. That's Wonderful. awesome. Well, thank you all so much for taking your time to share your insight about behind the music scene in Iceland. It's been awesome. And hopefully uh, there's a chance for people to check out live from Reykjavik. Like I mentioned, there's the discount code for my listeners specifically in the description. It was such a pleasure and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and enjoy live from Reykjavik coming up in very soon, just some days. Thank you so much, Jules. Lovely to speak with you. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks.